Hello, everyone. This is Chris Kopak, Assistant Vice President of Facilities at the University of Arizona and current APA president. We have a, a topic uh, today that is uh, very appropriate in terms of our campus safety and controlling and securing our campus buildings uh, with everything going on throughout, throughout the United States. Uh, today we have Asa Abloid. Uh, he has an outstanding presentation on innovative access control solutions for securing today's campus. Uh, as always, this will be an hour presentation. Uh, we will have roughly about 40 to 45 minute presentation, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, today joining us is Jeremy uh, Celine, Director of Business Development, Jim Kramovic, Director of Sales. Uh, we appreciate very much uh, Asad Abloy's support of APA and our members. Uh, as always, we'll be taking questions during the presentation. Uh, we have a large group, so this is really a, an outstanding topic. Uh, so please send me your questions. You can type those in. Uh, and the presentation at the end, within a week, will be posted on APA's webpage, uh, along with the video and the actual PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so with that said, guys, uh, thank you again, Jeremy and Jim. I appreciate you taking the time, and we appreciate very much your support of APA and giving back to our members in terms of educational opportunities. Uh, outstanding topic today, so take it away, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chris, and uh, I guess good afternoon, good morning, everyone, depending on where you're signing in from. This is Jeremy Celine, uh, like Chris mentioned I'm our director of business development for our higher education division uh, within ASA Abloy. I'm going to kind of take you through the first couple slides here as just an introduction uh, to ASA Abloy. We'll, we'll, we'll touch briefly on what the learning outcomes will be. We have a short uh, short video uh, just highlighting about a minute and a half uh, our, our organization a whole, holistically looking at the business and then we'll move into um, Jim's uh, presentation on looking at different technologies uh, that are in play today that can help uh, your campuses secure some buildings. So looking at some of the learning outcomes, um, the first one is you're going to walk away today with an understanding of the cost differences between what legacy access control uh, looks like and as far as what everyone's used to uh, deploying on their campus compared to what some of the innovative technologies exist today, such as wireless and IP-based products like power over Ethernet and Wi-Fi. Uh, second thing is we're going to discuss uh, how your campus investments in access control can also support future changes in credential technology. And that's a key takeaway because um, you definitely need to consider uh, both of those. If you're looking to move away from one credential to another, it's important that you understand what the impact could be from a technology standpoint with regards to the uh, select access control product that you may uh, th th that you may be interested in. And lastly, is we're going to review the process of selecting those uh, specific access control solutions that meet your campus budget and, and overall security needs and how those tie into uh, your specific lockdown uh, campus policy and procedure. So with that, we will cue uh, the video here, and then I'll, I'll pick it back up in about a minute. So thank you. Welcome to the world of ASA Abloy. Today, we will discuss the we offer a complete range of door opening solutions, making people feel safe and secure in simple and convenient ways. In 20 years, we have transformed from a local company to a global player with operations in more than 70 countries, both mature and emerging markets, with around 47,000 employees and sales over 71 billion kroners. ASA Abloy has a leading position in areas such as access control systems, identification technology, entrance automation, mechanical and electromechanical locking solutions, security doors, and hotel security. Profitable growth is the core of ASA Abloy. We achieve this by expanding into new markets, continuously developing innovative products, and exploring new ways to be more cost efficient. Welcome to ASA Abloy, the global leader in door opening solutions. Okay, well, thank you. So, one of the questions you may send in to Chris is what does uh, 71 billion or 71 billion kroners equate to uh, in US sales? So, uh, that's actually about $8.3 uh, billion in global US sales. Um, 
And one thing we take pride in here is you'll notice before we jump into to Jim's present or yet yeah, to uh, Jim's presentation is is from an innovation perspective we are a door and hardware and access control manufacturer but Forbes has actually ranked us um, as one of the the, the, the top hundred global uh, most innovative companies in what we do so this is across every uh, single company across the globe and and we're, we're proud to say back in 2013 we were actually ranked. Um, one point ahead of Apple. So that's something that we, uh, you know, it's at the core of, of what we do. So we're always going to be providing you as customers innovative solutions that can help uh, change your business for the positive. And then lastly here, uh, looking at the next slide, uh, is really just highlighting the brand. Some of you may be familiar uh, with some of these brands. Uh, you may already be utilizing our solutions at some level. Uh, from the Sargent to Corbin Russell to Norton to Medico, pretty much everything, every brand highlighted here in bold is everything that would go around the door opening, and that does include your doors and frames, wood doors, hollow metal, uh, stainless steel, et cetera, and then obviously our full line of mechanical, electromechanical hardware uh, that also represented by, by these brands here. So if one of them uh, looks familiar, uh, you may already be a customer of ours, and we'd love to continue that. Uh, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar, uh, hopefully you will be after today. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to, uh, to, to Jim to kind of dive us into uh, innovative solutions and, and what exists today. So, so thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Jim, are you there? Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. Uh, this is Jim Primovic. I'm the Director of Sales for the Campus uh, Access Control for ASA Abloy. I've been employed with ASA Abloy and, and working on uh, exclusively on campuses only for over 16 years. And I wake up in the morning and, and what we work on is one card systems and access control within the university market. So what we want to talk about today is, is life is changing, even in the access control world. Um, if you look at the screen here on, on, on the left side, it's more traditional. We've got the, the uh, pay phones, cash. On the right side, we're talking about where things are moving. And it can be a little bit confusing when you're moving into a mobile society and with Uber. And, but access control is moving that way as well. And we're, this presentation is going to cover that and, and some of the new things we're seeing. This is just a little bit of a fun fact. And um, in the last... Uh, the point here being, how long did it take to get 50 million users? And the telephone took 74 years. Radio took 38 years. Television, 13. So you see the theme here. We're starting to get quicker and quicker. Internet, it took four. iPod, it took three. Um, Facebook, it took nine. So anybody have a guess on the last one is the, the expectations and the speed to get to 50 million users. It's Pokemon, 12 days. So we're seeing that acceleration across the board, and it's also an access control as well. So what we're looking at is that uh, traditionally, you've got your mag locks, uh, electric strikes, uh, panels. And on the right side, you know, we're moving towards that, the PoE, where you've got mobile phones using the IP of, of uh, the networks on campus. And so there's really two things going on here. You've got the traditional mechanical locks all going uh, left to right keypad, offline, uh, data on card, which is a Saltos type of model, wireless solutions online. And as you go from towards the right, th the cost increases. So today, we estimate 95, 97% of the openings are still mechanical, all the way up to about 5% or what we're calling in intelligent openings. And everywhere in between is different solutions that provides for audits, scheduling, revoking access. Um, and all of this depends upon the system designs, local fire codes, and so forth. So this is to give you a visual of the different types of solutions um, that are associated with each of the columns, the keypad you've all known and used and probably have on your campus keypads, all the way up to uh, some, some very sophisticated online. For today, because it's campus, what we want to wrap our minds around is the wireless and the online. So going forward, we're going to take these, isolate these two uh, areas and, and really dig in. And so if we start first on the online, what we want to look at is the traditional doors. And at this point, we're going to start looking at the cost and everything associated with the locks going forward. So the first one is the traditional. Uh, you all know you have the DPS, 
You've got the Wigan output readers. You've got electric strikes, wall readers, nothing new here. Um, still a very good system. Need to use it. This is not going to go away. But what you're seeing is you use more for um, high security type of doors, maybe entrances um, around a, a campus uh, on the perimeter of doors. So the cost, the average cost of that, what you're seeing is about $3,500 per door. You now the costs break out. You've got about $1,400 in door components. You've got labor at 1,000. Now depending upon, sometimes campuses will say, ah, I can install this thing for, for $1,000. Usually what's there is that they've got really good support systems on campus and they're able to, to run cable, drop in some power, um, good lock shop, they'll put the, hang the, the locks on the door. And sometimes we'll, we'll talk and you say, $3,500, I, I can't do anything for under $5,200. And sometimes that gets into union unionization, but that's a good number overall. So you've got electrified lock, you've got door position switches, uh, wall readers. I think you guys uh, live and work with these types of systems. Notice to the left here, the power consumption is about $21, $22 a year on an average uh, if you've got 20 to 30 watts of power being consumed. So we want to move to another type of offline, so Wigan, or it's an integrated lock style. And really, what does that mean? Same topology. You've got access control. You've got a network. You've got a, a panel and door, door controllers. And, and what you're seeing here is that you're losing the door position switch, the RECs. It's all now integrated into a single lock. Um, and, and that provides a lot of benefits. In, and one of them is from the maintenance perspective, you don't have to have that specialist that understands all the door position switches or rexes. It's all in one lock. It's all the, uh, it's held, all the components in that one lock case. It can be either a Wigan or a 485 bus. The other thing you don't see here, we have to consider it, is the power. We've got to run power to that door. And, and that cost runs about 3000 And once again, it gets into unionization and local, what your campus is, type of support that your campuses can provide for you. But what we're seeing here is that this is really, um, we're starting to see this in offices. We've got to, well, you want to have a nicer look to it. It's all componentized. It's in one lock set. It's used, we're seeing on president's doors, offices that are, that are important for aesthetics. And the, the power consumption on this one's about $20 a year. So we're going to move forward to, to another online that's PoE. And this is where we're starting to get into the newer technologies, power over Ethernet. So what, what we're talking about is the ability to use one cable that runs power and data from a PoE switch uh, to home run. So let's break this down a little bit more. So you have an uh, OEM software program going out onto your internet. There are no panels devices here. This is a network cable plugged right into a PoE switch that provides power and data to that door. So we're running a home run from the network switch uh, to the top of the door, down the frame, and across the, uh, the hinge or uh, EPT, electronic transfer, to the lock. We're plugging in just like you would plug in your, your network printer. Uh, we're seeing it about, takes about 50% less uh, install time. It's about 85% less standby power. Now, the important part here is you don't lose any aspects of the online uh, features. So once again, you've got the ability to hit a button and lock it down, just like you would the other two uh, systems we looked at. What we're seeing, the average cost, and that's about $2,300. And the important feature here is the amount of power. You're looking at about half the cost of the power over a, a period of a year. So what does this lock do and don't do? It, it does everything that a full featured uh, access control opening would do. Lockdowns, uh, unlocks, card notifications, door position switch, everything is enclosed here. What we're seeing this used for though, it's a little bit weak or it is weak uh, when you wanna put ADA openers on there. There's really no dry contacts to put in auto openers. So that's something to be aware of with a PoE solution. You, can, you could hook fire alarms uh, to the PoE switch. It just needs to be a, a conversation uh, when you're thinking about a PoE switch. Just a little more investigation and wiring and thought put into it when you want to put in um, a fire alarm to drop the power so that you're meeting local codes. 
So does everything that a traditional opening does, less power, less cost, and it's uh, network related. What we're also seeing this too is that um, the expertise required around this door is changing as well. As you can see that uh, it's getting more into the IT type of personnel. So there's conversations had around what is, how does my lock shop handle this? Or, or how do I get in IT involved? And we're seeing a development, I'm calling it a hybrid, where you've got an IT person working in a lock shop or a lock shop guy working in the IT department handling these kind of openings. Uh, we're seeing a new construction. Uh, last year, we probably had about 15 res hall um, constructions where POE was is involved. We're typically seeing these on the suite doors. So you know the new configuration where you've got a suite door and four bedroom doors behind it. This is a great solution uh, for that, that main entrance door. University of Pittsburgh did a um, ROI study, and they're saving about, and this is where we get a lot of our numbers from, from end users who uh, we ask and they volunteer information, but they're saving over $27,000 a year on power alone. Now there's a cost associated with it. You're talking about $1,500, I'm talking about uh, POE and the cost uh, involved with that, but there's a cost justification to them, and, and it's a really, really good story. And uh, if you ever want to dig deeper, we can help you uh, take a visit there and really talk to them on what they were seeing and why they went with the POE. Great story. So now we're going down a little more technology into the wireless openings, and there's a lot to talk about here. There's several types of wireless. Uh, one of the ones that we're going to dig in here is, is uh, it's 2.4 gigahertz. It's the uh, Zigbee-like, or same topology is 900 megahertz. And then we're gonna get into the Wi-Fi. There's, these are the two different types of, of, of wireless out in the market. So the um, wireless th that has the 2.4 Zigbee uh, and 900 megahertz, looks, topology looks like this. You've got the software, You've got a network going to your standard access control panels with your door controllers. So that piece is no different than your traditional doors. What becomes different is the hub or the PIM that sets on top of that door. So you've got uh, communications from the desktop to the hub. So these locks to, uh, are, are driven by battery operated locks, but the obviously the wireless infrastructure is, is hard powered. Where do we see these fitting into? Well, res halls, uh, hard to, to fit places where you just can't run data uh, in power. We'll just shoot a, um, a radio frequency across the courtyard or, or down the hall to these, uh, to these locks and be able to communicate. There's a lot going on in what we're calling additional form factors, the ability to do server closets, um, server racks, um, drawers, uh, cabinets. So the ability in a different form factor where you're able to use uh, access control on server racks or closets or cabinets that uh, traditionally haven't been able to, to, to put access control on. So how does it really work and the cost? It's about $2,600 in opening. So the door component's about $1,400, labor drops. Sometimes when you get quotes on this, you're, when you, you uh, making sure that there's two components to a system like this. One is the lock itself, but then you have the whole additional infrastructure where you have to have the panel, the, uh, the uh, hub or PIM. So don't be uh, misled by just getting a, the cost of the lock. So what makes these locks special? Well, they're, they're battery operated. They run on a pulse or a heartbeat uh, between the hub or the, uh, the, the, pan, uh, the, um, the PIM. So that heartbeat, so it's constantly communicating. The lock is constantly communicating to the panel. It can be tweaked from two, two seconds up to 10 seconds. It's, it's user defined. And so based upon the, the heartbeat or the pulse is how, much, how many times you're communicating with that lock. Now, if you present a card within that pulse, the lock will automatically wake up at the time of the presentation. So I present the credential to the lock. It, at that point, there's no intelligence in this lock. It goes back out to the panel, verifies yes or no, comes back and says yes, let that student in. So there's that heartbeat um, capability which, which enables you to actually do a lockdown feature wirelessly. So I have a situation where I want to lock down a res hall or a dorm or a suite or whatever the case may be. I have the ability to hit a button, 
the commands go out through the network to the hub, and it will, when the heartbeat, will send down the command lockdown. Now, I'm not a fan of of, of lockdowns being wireless. I'm, to, I'm of, of the, the belief that if you want a true lockdown and it's important enough lockdown, you should be hardwired. But this really offers a lot of versatility in some of the situations that uh, where you've got to have a lockdown capability. So it's battery operated. Works off a heartbeat. And that heartbeat is can be user defined. This slows down to you know sub two seconds, and um, you have the lockdown ca capabilities or card denied, door forced, door propped, all the communications that you would have with another with the traditional system for about twenty six hundred dollars. This is a the topology. Just to give you another angle, that topology. There's two two things here. Is that you have the OEM software with the panel with the, the hub or PIM. Um, above the ceiling, and and then you go down to one the hub or PIM, depending on which systems you're working with, and the ability to communicate with those doors. Now, there's either uh, because this is not a network appliance, is you're creating your own network here. The hub or PIM will either work to eight devices or 16 devices, because, depending upon the configuration and the design of the building. The Zigbee will go about 50 feet from the hub. The 900 megahertz goes about 150 feet from the, the PIM. So really, really good alternatives for those tough to define uh, doors where you want to have some good access control. The Wi-Fi locks. Now, this is uh, uh, one of the fastest growing locks out there in the marketplace. What we're saying is that a Wi-Fi lock uses the existing 802.11 BGNF type of, of network. The lock is on is battery operated, sitting on the network. In this case, the Wi-Fi lock, there's no wake on land. So the lock, what the downside of the, of the Wi-Fi lock is you cannot hit a button and lock it down. But the good news is you can do everything else but a, a, a true lockdown. So uh, I'm sitting in an EAC system. I'm sitting in front of my desktop. I want to hit a button and lock it down, cannot be done. But what can you do? You can send out schedules. You can send out changes. You can send out everything you would normally do with a uh, traditional access control system. But there, there's going to be a delay in the communications to that lock. That communication delay can, can, can run six hours, 12 hours. It's kind of user-defined and depends upon the battery. Now, that all being said, what a Wi-Fi lock can do all the, the alarms and all the wake-ups are initiated at the lock. So what does that mean? If I have a, a door propped, door forced, low battery, card unknown, that lock immediately wakes up, jumps on a network, and communicates back to the uh, OEM software and says, okay, what do I do? Is this card good? Is, uh, um, uh, do you want a lockdown? And the lockdown in this case, once again, it's delayed. So this is a wonderful lock for those doors that are already locked. An example of that would be, maybe it's a comm closet, a lab, res hall doors, where the doors are already locked. There's no need for a lockdown. So the ability, this door has, it can run schedules. It will notify locked, uh, excuse me, uh, low batteries, door unknown, uh, card unknown, door force, door propped. Has about 48 configuration settings. And if you break it down, it gets into, into the 70s. But Really, really good uh, solution. It drives access control deeper into the building for about $1,800. Now, there are batteries, uh, depending upon how many times it wakes up and, and so forth. We're seeing anywhere between 16 to 18 months uh, on a battery, uh, battery life uh, of these locks. Really, really good for doors that are already locked, uh, comp closets, res halls, dorm doors, things of that, that nature. So the, the real-time security, and we're going to start going into the, the little bit of, of the lockdown, which we've been talking about, but it's important to understand. The PoE and the Wi-Fi have all of these notifications going back to, into the head end real-time. You're seeing uh, door force, door propped, unauthorized cards, low batteries, everything that you would want uh, sent back to the uh, monitoring station. But in the Wi-Fi, you can't hit a button and lock it down. 
So the cost comparisons, and this is a, a really good slide, we'll spend some time here, is that when you're sitting down and, and analyzing the cost, you, you'll see the, the, the approximate cost related here. But what you need to do is, is, is also look into that door narrative. How do I want that door to, to behave when a card is presented? How do I want that door to behave when I hit the lockdown? So there's lots of considerations in the cost. And then you get into, if you're building a lead type of building, the uh, POE and the Wi-Fi do have some really good certification and some really good uh, documentation to help you achieve that lead type of certification. So lots to think about here. There's also local fire codes that we'll get into. Um, and really, what is that student experience going to be at that door when I present that credential? Card technology. We can't talk about access control without talking about card technology. And a lot of one of the number one questions I get on campus is, is, is the mag card going away? Well, not anytime soon. We're still thinking there's 60, 70, 80% of the campuses are driven off mag, mag cards because of the cost. So we want to talk about the card technology here. So the lock you see here is the, how do you handle migration? You need to have an access control need. You want to put something on a door. But the card office is saying, ah, you know, we, we don't know what, what we're going to do from a card perspective. You don't want to be, buy a lock and be outdated in a six month a year. The lock that you see on the screen has the ability to, to do mag. It's a vertical swipe. So you're using existing technology. And then the, the black part of that lock is actually um, a multi-class reader that will read any technology. My fair, my fair classic DVS cards, uh, NFC, BLE. So the ability to act now with what you have and what system, and then the ability to grow into a, into a card um, of, of the future. This, is, this, this lock, particular lock takes care of that. So when you're thinking about card technology and, and you're indecisive about, we don't know where the card technology is going, no need to really stop from an access control standpoint because this lock is designed to handle anything coming down at least within the next two years. So what are you talking about? locks and, and, and card types, we really don't need to get bogged down into where my card is going. Is it going Desfire EV1, EV2? What's important is that uh, we believe, or I believe it's a multi-class reader able to do NFC enabled and BLE. Um, going back, NFC is near field communications. It's really in BLE. And this is talking about the mobile uh, aspect of, it, of the students using their phones. Um, Probably about four years ago, NFC was a really hot item. NFC is going to take over the world. When in fact, um, Apple said, you know, we're not releasing NFC uh, for any commercial uh, type of, of, of use cases with our phone. And then suddenly BLE popped up because all phones have BLE. So there's a difference when you are talking and when you get into the mobile credential, there's a different experience at, the, at each of the readers. If you go BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, it's the ability for that to put a phone in front of a, of a reader, and the BLE and the NFC is more of a communication device. It's a wire, a wireless wire. It's not about the security or the card type. So by getting a, a mobile NFC reader and BLE reader, you can bypass all of the getting bogged down into what's the card type going to be. You don't care. You're set for the future, uh, and, and you're able to handle any of the decisions coming out of the card office. So this is just a, a, a visual where the phone's going. This is, um, there's lots to think about when you go mobile. I would get a, an expert involved with it. Does the phone wake up when you present it to the reader? Do you have to open up the app? Uh, what happens when the battery dies? Lots to talk about, lots to think about, but this uh, um, shows how the, these phones are growing on the campuses. One of the things you may be seeing too is, is biometrics, you know, for in access control. This kind of blends in with the card type. You're getting pressure to, uh, or possibly being asked, hey, I need to take student enrollment. How do we do that? What do we do? A couple of different things going on. A lot of campuses are going, if you look at the biometrics uh, the uh, slide, the top left, you're seeing a hand wave. If you haven't seen them, I would go out into YouTube and Google uh, hand wave biometric devices. It's amazing what these are able to do. So you have a situation where a professor needs to take uh, a role in a 300-person uh, class, how do you do that? Well, what we're seeing is campuses start to take the, as students walk into the, into the classroom, 
They're simply waving their hand over top of uh, the reader, and, and they're able to identify their fingerprints by waving it over top, and then therefore the enrollment. So we're seeing these type of, of biometrics in, in the university market where you've got a large volume of people that you want to maybe muster or you want to take find attendance. To the right is a facial recognition. A lot of people are talking about this, but it hasn't come to fruition yet because of the cost. But we are seeing the biometrics. Coming off a sports field, uh, maybe you'll see more f facial recognition, thumbprint, sweating gets a little bit, gets a little bit sticky. The bottom is a, a really good solution, iris scans. So this is uh, Georgia Southern University. They had a, a large food service uh, open up, and they traditionally had four or five lanes. And so they had to have a person in each lane verifying that the card is being swiped is actually the student. They do a visual check on the card versus student face. This is saying, hey, we know who you are because you know we're, we're uh, registering your iris um, and checking the database. And if you look closely, you'll see a green light, red light. So the ability is they have five lanes and one person working all five lanes. So it's a visual check. If you don't want to do biometrics, you go over to the lane, you wait in line, and the person will do the, the uh, physical verification that the card you're swiping is actually you. The other four lanes are designed for the person, the student, the backpack or phone in hand who doesn't want to pull out the card. They look down. It's about a one or two second read. Uh, if they're if they're able to go where they have the, the credits to go into to eat the uh, the food service, the green light appears. So one person monitoring four lines, and it's pretty quick. So we're starting to see biometrics and, and, and come up, and you're also starting to see um, some really crazy stuff that that uh, uh, I monitor. This is a ring. So the idea being is is that um, maybe a math teacher comes in and say, you know what, I want my students to be able to wear a ring and and to be able to get to their laptops. And, and what you're seeing here is the ability on the left is as you slide your finger across, you see a little square in that ring. It's actually taking your thumbprint. So now we know you should, you're able to, to it, it activates this ring because you, you're the person that, that's been encoded to. And then the ability to go around campus and taxis and do food service and with that ring. A lot of downsides. When you get those kind of crazy um, I would always deflect it back to biometrics and, and, and um, maybe there's something there that could be done or sticking to your one card mobile. But just want to know, let you know that there's, you're going to more and more of these type of solutions are popping up and you're going to get more and more of these types of questions. Um, biometrics solves a lot of problems, but probably not this ring one. I don't think how it fits in the campus market. So moving on from, from the card credentials and, and, and getting into the lockdown and, and how that works and, and how you handle it. By no means is, is this the author authoritative uh, uh, presentation on lockdown. This is a really, really complex uh, topic, but we do want to address it and, 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 and talk about it. Um, traditionally, there's been you know, two ways to do a lockdown, either uh, centralized, where you hit one button and locks down everything across campus, or you decentralize where you say you know each building or each classroom is going to be able to do their own um, we believe there's there's really a mix between the two what we're seeing is the the ability in urban areas you really want to do that that centralized because the re response time tends to be much quicker one or two minutes for um, security to get on on site to, to assess the situation uh, decentralized uh, tends to be more in the rural type where you may have a response time three, four, five, seven minutes. Uh, you don't have the ability to get on campus and assess that. But we're seeing a lot of different people trying a lot of different things. I won't name the school, but there's a West Coast school that actually has a lockdown, a decentralized, where it actually locks down that building um, button right next to the fire pool. So right next to the fire alarm is a lockdown so the students are able to make decisions on their own hey do i want to lock this building down do i have a threat pulling it there's lots of uh conversation around that um i i don't know what to tell you other than the fact that that's being looked at and, and being done so what does this mean from a lock perspective um, what i'm suggesting is you get your local fire code local police to help you under determine what action you want to take in that building. But from a locking solution, you've got some options. 
You've got the integrated Wigan with the intelligent locks, with the ability to do real-time lockdown on demand. And you've got the um, power over Ethernet offers a real-time lockdown. You even have the wireless solutions, the uh, ones that you are uh, 2.4 gig or the 900 megahertz, where you could do a lockdown. So the the local decision uh, per campus needs to be made. But the, what we're trying to what I'm saying here is that based upon what you're finding are with your um, local jurisdictions, um, there's some lo solutions that you can have. Now, once again, getting into the wireless so that there's no confusion here, the Wi-Fi you cannot lock down. The, the 2.4 gigahertz Zigbee or the 900 megahertz uses a heartbeat, and that heartbeat enables you to lock down. If the heartbeat's every three or four seconds, there's probably going to be three or four seconds before you lock that, that building down or that particular door. On the back of those, uh, locks is uh, what we call a shelter in place type of button. So you're an electronic lock, you're battery operated, you're decentralized. Um, how do you lock it down? Well, on the inside battery cover of these locks is the ability, there's a, a, a red amber light that a student or teacher could push and that locks that lock down. That individual lock is locked out. A card presented will no longer work. Now, it, if you do your homework and you set this up correctly, you want the first responders to be able to override that. So there's different hierarchies of, of uh, authoritative cards or uh, credentials. But day-to-day -day users are essentially locked out by pushing that button. So I'm in a classroom. I feel threatened. There's no central lockdown. I have the ability to walk over to the door, push a button, and any uh, standard credential will not have access into that, into that room. So it's a blinking red light and it gives a notification. Um, and then the Wi-Fi, we've, I, I beat this to death, but I think it's important to know because there's um, the ability, this Wi-Fi lock has that uh, shelter in place button as well. So if any at any one point uh, the student feels threatened, teacher feels threatened, the ability to push that button on a Wi-Fi lock and shut it down. So offers a lot of solutions, a lot of things out there. To, to talk about, to think about, um, know that this matrix kind of helps put it all into place. The global lockdown, uh, privacy mode, and that button also can be called privacy mode or shelter in place. So know that there, uh, in recapping, there's, there's locking considerations based upon price, lead considerations, uh, current environment of the building, and is, is it a retrofit, is it new construction? You've got to take into consideration local jurisdictions on how they want you to behave, um, fire codes. But there are a lot of new locking solutions out there for you, a lot of options to take a look at. Take the time, educate yourself. The credential is a big piece of that. There's solutions and they say, you know what, we can't do anything because we don't know the card. That shouldn't stop you anymore. The ability to have a multi-class lock that reads mag and uh, intelligent uh, type of, of phones um, enables you to, to take action and to move forward on uh, securing those type of openings. And then lastly, you've got the fire code restrictions and a lockdown. Uh, it tends to be a really big item that we're all wrestling with. There's no one answer, one solution. You've got centralized, decentralized. You've got hybrids of that. Um, my recommendation is that to take your time, get a lot of people involved, like I know you already do in the committees, and, and move forward, but uh, do move forward. So with that, um, Jeremy, I'll toss it back to um, our hosts. Well, Jim and Jeremy, thank you very much. And I'll tell you, this is a, a very appropriate topic for uh, what's been going on. Uh, it's critical to our buildings, the rapid technology. Uh, we have so many questions coming in, a large group. Uh, so I'm just going to jump right to the questions. Heck, we have folks from Australia all the way to uh, Canada and Mexico, and we'll be getting to those wow. questions. I know it covers it covers the whole gamut, so that is just outstanding. Hey, one of the questions comes from Roy Christian. Uh, what are the possibility of a scaled integration having the existing systems in some buildings by migrating to the latest technology? So, if I could, um, hopefully, I'm answering this correctly. The ability it's all driven by the software. What we're seeing is that you can mix and match these solutions. So one, if within the building, within the room, you don't necessarily have to have one type of wireless lock or a POE throughout the building. You can mix and match. I don't know if that answers the question or not. 
So you could take an existing building and retro, if it's got uh, hardwired on the perimeter, the ability to go in there now and say, let's go deeper into the building. Let's, uh, let's do Wi-Fi. Let's do 900 megahertz. Let's add existing locks to it on the same system with the same. And it gets back to the credential. Can the credential handle it? I don't know if I answered the question or not. That, that sounds real good. We appreciate that. Hey, if one of the questions comes to, uh, and it goes back to the rapid technology, comment again, Jim. You were talking new technology, and we're seeing this with the rapid rate of change throughout all our facilities uh, with the, having the ability to stay on top of that curve. Touch base a little bit further on that. You talk 50 billion users, rapid change. Uh, discuss that a little further because the systems today, how quickly are they going to be outdated tomorrow? Right. That, that, that is a current theme. Hey, and what I'm buying today, is it going to work uh, two years from now, three years from now? Here's what I can honestly say. I, I don't know. What I see out of it, and that's why I'm out looking on the horizon. But what, what we do know is that we can look two to three years out. It looks to be IP driven. If anything, it's going more towards the, the network and IP based uh, POE, Wi Fi, where there's a standardization and you're using existing infrastructure. A couple of reasons there. You've got the labor that understand it, so the, um, and you're, there's no duplication or setting up. Uh, you're utilizing better infrastructure. Um, what we're seeing is that what's going to change rapidly may not be so much the, the locking technology and the network technology is the card. And that's why I'm talking about if you get yourself into readers that have NFC or BLE, the card technology is going to be the biggest mover. Is Apple ever going to come out and say, hey, let's go NFC and we're going to open it up? Then what happens? Then it becomes about the mobile phone in, with our students. I think the latest number I saw was somewhere, um, depending on which campus you go to, is that that um, 60 to 70 percent of the, of the students are using Apple phones. I don't know how that relates to, to your campuses, but uh, that's what we're seeing. So what does that mean? Um, I, I can't honestly say two to three years out, all network driven. But if you get yourself a BLE and an NFC reader, I think you're going to take yourself into the future for a good piece. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, getting to uh, another technical question from Scott Albert. Uh, if you kill the power to the Wi-Fi lock, uh, does it fail to the lock mode? Now, this is a Wi-Fi lock. So Wi-Fi locks are battery operated. It's independent of any decisions or anything going on there. So if I, I'm a, I'm a Wi-Fi lock. The battery dies. It is programmable. How do you want that lock to die? You want it to die in a lock state or unlock state? Uh, now, we also have uh, reports or indicators that tell you about low battery indicators that, hey, look, you know, room 101's got six months left on a battery. Room 101's got two months. So you're able to anticipate that. Um, so it does, it will die. If it does die, it dies in the state that you chose, choose it to. Um, it does not lose its memory but it will lose the ability to, to read the card. Excellent, thank you Thank you very much. And Jeremy, feel free to jump on in. Uh, these questions just keep coming and we, and we have a, a ample time uh, to take more, so feel free to type them in. Uh, uh, Keith Webb, uh, just to let you know too, and for everybody who may have came on just a few minutes late, uh, the presentation will be available on our APA webpage. Uh, all the questions, uh, Will be a follow-up too. We'll put a, a master spreadsheet there with the presentation. But coming to Leo Fincher, Leo, Leo Fincher Johnson. Hello, Leo. Uh, glad you're calling in uh, from Australia, no less. Uh, he he wants, has a question regarding the license, the annual license. I note that the solution includes the initial, or does the solution include the initial annual license cost, particularly for the wireless solution? Touch base on how that all works. Yeah, the, the the licensing fees we see here in the states uh, um, are all related to the OEM software platform. So if you're using um, Linnell, Software House, uh, Open Options, uh, Genetech, the license is uh, will come from them, um, not so much the lock manufacturer. So that will be included in your software pricing. And so is that a annual uh, fee, though, that uh, facilities, uh, lock shops, and key desks need to uh, factor into their overall cost? Good question, and it's going to be OEM-driven. That's kind of a software, uh, um, depending on their business model of that particular OEM security software. 
Okay. Th thank you very much. You know, you talked about the mag cards. Uh, rest in peace, if I recall the slide correctly. Uh, card technologies. Yeah. And maybe, yeah. maybe just comment again. Hopefully we don't see those go away. We still believe they're going to be around for a little while. Yeah, the one, yeah we the one do. Thing oh, on go, that, ahead, go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, I was just going to say, we. I was just in some meetings yesterday, and that conversation always comes up. And really, from a campus perspective, the one thing that's um, really driving MagStripes to continue to be there is is what happens on, on the summer camps, um, you know, obviously during break, when you have a number, of, depending on the size of the institution, you may have thousands of kids come through on a, on a, on a regular basis and, and handing them a, you know, 50 cent mag stripe card compared to a higher dollar, uh, credential. It just really doesn't make financial sense. Um, a lot of kids like to take that, potentially take the card home as a souvenir or whatever it may be. So that's one of the advantages of the differences in technology and design of the lock that, that, that you saw today. It, it provides you that flexibility to, you know, have your students during the regular time uh, of, of classes in school and, and being on campus utilize a higher secure credential, maybe even a phone uh, in the future, but then your summer camps can go back to utilizing a mag stripe potentially. So that's that's kind of why we see that always always kind of being there. I mean, you're going to be able to do some things to, uh, you know, add some security to the mag stripe card potentially, but but ultimately that, that track there can be used for that, and a lot of that's driven by by those summer camps for sure. So. Perfect. Jim, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I would agree with that. It's just that it gets into that, the cost of the card and also the security of that card. So, put it dead on. Good. Thanks, Jim and Jeremy. More questions are coming in here. And so, uh, this is from uh, Greg K. Uh, Connect. Uh, where do we get more information on the BLE? Well, you're a manufacturer, but if you go ahead and Google BLE to get an understanding of how it works and what it works, it's a, it's really a standard um, that all the phone companies or the mobile phones work with. But uh, your manufacturer of the locks would be able to provide some. And Jeremy, you can add. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll make sure, um, uh, Greg, that you know if there's questions followed up here, we can make sure that we have our local uh, representation in the field, follow up with you and, and get you what you need um, in terms of understanding the Bluetooth low energy options a little bit better. Just to comment on, on the the BLE, every mobile phone we have found is a little bit different. So, uh, or the antennas are placed differently in the phone. And they also act differently when they're presented to the reader. Sometimes you gotta hold a little bit to the right, some phones you got a little bit to the left. So the BLE is not, if you've done anything with BLE uh, in mobile access, uh, it's not a true read. We are seeing, um, and this is not a plug for NFC, it's just a, a fact that NFC is a little cleaner, quicker read than BLE. Just a heads up, it's not a, a panacea where, the, boy, I'm just going to go to BLE, it's going to be it's gonna be great. There are there are issues there, and, and, to be, and I would just uh, test it and pilot it before you uh, roll it out. Excellent. Another question coming in regarding training, which is a uh, critical. Uh, as our industry is going through a major transformation with our baby boomers retiring, our business partners and ASA Abloid is going to play a critical role uh, in training of our new staff and our current staff to keep them up up to speed on the latest technology. And so the question from Keith Webb, does ASA Abloid train customer technicians to service the locks or readers? Jeremy, I'll let you do that. Yeah, um, we have a full full range uh, ASA Abloy Academy, which um, it's called. It's, it's a blend. It is for our customers. Um, it is a blend of offering uh, on you know in o over e-commerce, or I guess you say e-e-learning. Uh, e I guess you could say as well as even potentially uh, some in-class type training at some of our uh, satellite uh, factories and that across the country. Um, so, so there's a number of different uh, training courses available to, to learn a little bit more about the technology and how to deploy it, et cetera. And then to go one step further, we've actually, uh, for those of you that know about our, our mobile showrooms, um, I think Chris has actually seen one at his campus, but uh, we actually uh, have a mobile installation training vehicle as well, um, which basically means you can, do, you can run classes for technicians and, and, and different personnel on a number of different topics 
whether it's electromechanical locks, uh, access control solutions, mechanical uh, locks, door closers, et cetera. And, and those are actually 53 foot trailers that'll go and get parked at a, a particular location. And then you can, instead of shipping your uh, you know team members somewhere like back to our factory, we could potentially bring that capability to you. Um, but you know, as far as our uh, online IP based products and that, a lot of what you saw today, um, you know, those are, are typically so I'll let Jim elaborate on this a little bit, but um, you know, those are our channel partners and authorized installers that, you know, you have to take certain classes and, and, and get approved in order to install our, our products. We, we get to ask that question a lot about, um, uh, you know, lo just local install lo local maintenance people installing some of the locks, and uh, we just want to make sure everyone that, uh, that, that that's touching them, you know, are trained and um, they're authorized through our system. So I'll let I'll let Jim comment on that too. Yeah, the, we have certification programs for installers and, and for integrators, but you, you know, when you put technologies out there, anybody can install them. How do you maintain them, and, and how do you train your guys in, in, in the facility shop or IT or lock shop? So we have a, a gosh, I, I don't know what the number is. It's a crazy number of, of 500 courses uh, that covers everything uh, on IP locks and the basics of how it works, how it understands. And then we're getting in, into some um, different uh, tech support tools where you're actually taking a video and showing the, the 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 product and saying, here's what's you know you can point to it. And our techs are online helping you walk through the issues. So. It's a. We understand with the new technologies, new, new new set of training and new set of rules, and we're fully equipped with the uh, Ass Abloy uh, University online courses, and and you can get with us and and sign up for those courses. They're free. Uh, they're online. And as Jeremy Jeremy mentioned, there we have a uh, a, a truck that goes around. And it's really it's uh, the response has been unbelievable. Hey, hey guys, if you can, and uh, this is just a critical question too of training our staff. Uh, and we like the fact that it's a partnership. There's no cost to our, our universities to get our staff trained. Uh, and so the drive-in workshop that you're referencing, some folks may not be aware of it. Uh, APA offers a great partnership with our business partners uh, to go ahead and uh, host, uh, have a host university uh, and a business partner uh, come in and do a, a two to four to six hour training session. A uh, comment just briefly on that again, guys, because that, that's going to be an opportunity for a number of our or hundreds of folks around the line to get additional training. Yeah, we've. Um, I know last year I was I was personally involved with. Uh, I think over the last year, year and a half, um, we've done close to thirteen different Apple workshops. Um, you know, we we really kind of focused the the content on a little bit of what you saw today, and we we added some uh, information around sustainability. And how those different solutions can contribute to your your new lead version four requirements, and then we talked about building information modeling. But I mean, if there's a need for uh, potential further deep dives and actual workshops on training on these particular products, I mean, we have a full staff of training personnel that I'm sure uh, not only do they have their uh, you know uh, brick and mortar locations that they're in, but I would assume that they would be. Um, you know, very capable of potentially traveling as well um, to maybe have some deeper class classroom type setting where you get a little bit deeper into some of these technologies. So, I, absolutely. I mean, if there's a, if there's a need, I, I, I'd love to do it. I, I have money budgeted to complete, I think, upwards of six workshops this year, and uh, we're we're going to start filling the schedule here in the balance of the year. So, so please let myself or or Chris know. That that's perfect. I know uh, over in a. Uh... At APA and Alexandria, they will go ahead and schedule that and then uh, work with our universities literally throughout the country. Uh, our locksmiths is a, a fine art, and uh, having uh, Asad Abloy assist us, we appreciate that. Uh, more questions we got here, and so we want to go ahead and take a question here. Uh, we have another one from Leo. Uh, with respect to a lockdown situation, does a local fire alarm normally automatically override any exit door and is this a potential for a flaw? Well, I, it gets down to local jurisdictions. You can program it that way. Well, read the question again. I'm sorry. It was a fire yeah. alarm. And so it talks about with respect to a lockdown situation, does a local fire alarm normally automatically override any exit door? Uh, and is this a potential for, uh, for a flaw? 
Yeah, I think we experienced a little bit of that down in uh, in Miami, uh, the last uh, K through 12 issue, where uh, the fire alarm went off and and there was some confusion. I don't know how to answer that question. I, I uh, there is a there would be a flaw there. Um, I, I'm going to have to say local jurisdiction will dictate the actions. I know that the the, uh, the security platforms can perform what you want it to perform, but I, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I'm I'm sorry. Okay. And I, I would have to say that's a, a combination when uh, you are looking at keyless access, uh, as I know we have at the University of Arizona, and we have several phases, uh, partnering with our, our folks on the keyless access side. It's also a partnership with our fire department, uh, in-house fire department, our risk management, and our, our local uh, campus police to make sure everybody's on the same page uh, and all applicable codes are being followed. We got another question that has come in, a question regarding to make sense uh, let's see, with respect to the lockdown situation, uh, and maybe we've answered this already. Actually, we have. Sorry about that. Leo, we're, we're, we appreciate all your questions here. Uh, let's see. Patrick, we appreciate very much. We're glad you're finding this very helpful. Uh, we, You know, we have folks uh, from Washington. Dan, I just want to give a shout out to you. Dan Castile, uh, you, you've been attending these webinars uh, routinely. We appreciate that. Uh, we have, can you remark about the self-powered door controls using kinetic energy. And that's from Roy Christian. Jeremy, you go ahead. you can jump in there. I was uh I was processing the question. I'm not hundred percent sure what is he uh what is Roy referring to exactly when he's saying self powered well, maybe we're talking good. about en energy harvesting. Yep. Um, they're talking about the solar uh, law. I'll, I'll tell you what, we'll come back to that question or we'll have that as a follow up on our web page. But maybe a, a, another great question uh, for Jim here. And it really talks about Star Trek. Uh, it talks about the cutting edge technology updates, uh, its phone apps, and its keyless access, its facial recognition. And you're starting to see the facial recognitions in airports now. Uh, what about security of that data that the readers, we're, we're hearing more and more of, of compromise situations. How are you securing those systems if you're using uh, thumbprints, if you're using, I, I believe you said iris scans even. How are we keeping that information secure? Yeah, every uh, manufacturer has a different platform. I do a, a lot of reading on this, and, and that is one of the questions out there. It depends on which article you read and which expert you listen to. But that each, uh, there's a lot of encryption going on. One of the biometrics, uh, what requires is you can imagine a lot of data storage. How do you protect that data? How do you keep it from getting hacked? And if it is hacked, what do you do with it? So the, the, there is an issue out there. It is addressed and it, it's uh, different companies have different solutions. Um, once again, when you get it and you look at your manufacturers and you talk about the different biometrics and if it's iris scan and how do you, the, the questions are, how do you encrypt your information? Talk to them about how they're securing that data. Uh, great question, but every manufacturer has a different twist. I don't see any standardization yet, so to speak, um, but it is coming. Excellent. Well, guys, we're getting close to wrapping up and we got more questions we're gonna have time to do. Uh, as we've always done with our questions, we will have a master spreadsheet with the questions. We'll follow up with Jeremy and, and Jim. Make sure we get them answered. They'll be posted on Apple's webpage. Uh, Jeremy, do you have any final comments before we close? Yeah, I would just like to say thank you for uh, everyone's attendance today. And, and for sure, I'm sure there's this is definitely some challenging topics. And just know that uh, manufacturers like like us, uh, Agasa Abloy, we really understand the partnership aspect of this. And and we have a number of different solutions on our continuum that um, we're not necessarily going to push you in the right in, in one down one avenue or another. We're just going to make sure that you're educated and you understand exactly what you're purchasing and making sure that it meets your desired needs on, on campus. So please, you know, reach out to us if you have questions. We'd be uh, more than happy to consult with you and and uh, and get your campus on a on a journey towards uh, innovative access control. So Chris and Renee, uh, we, we appreciate the platform today, and um, thank you, Jim, for uh, being our uh, technical guy, and appreciate you going through the uh, presentation today. So uh, thank you, guys.
right. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And how about you? Any final comments? Yes. Once again, thank you for the APA. What a, what a great organization. And it just shows um, with, with the attendance here how important this issue is that just take your time. There are, there are solutions out there. Please work with your local jurisdiction to understand what they're expecting of you and then find a solution. Uh, but I would start there first and then know that there's a bunch of new solutions out there. Take your time. Do pilots. Test them out on a one, two, three openings and make sure you get everybody involved before you make your decisions. But thanks again. Wonderful, wonderful organization. Well, Jeremy and Jim, we appreciate very much you taking time out of your day. We appreciate very much ASA and Abloy being a very solid partner for APA, a great organization. Uh, we appreciate that collaborative partnership. Uh, these webinars have been a big hit. We have routinely hundreds of people who attend them. Uh, give a shout out to Lisa Potter, our former president of the Rocky Mountain Association. I'd like to say hi to everybody from Greg to Kelly. Uh, and all those who put in questions, we appreciate that very much. Uh, next webinar is scheduled for April 26. April 26. Uh, we are going to make a change uh, time-wise. Since we already have April scheduled for uh, 3 o'clock time, uh, we did have a request uh, from James Campbell. Could we go ahead and look at changing the times? And so we're going to start those in May and alternate. Uh, try to make sure we're accommodating for our Eastern members to all the way to our Pacific members. We'll look at that doing, during May. Uh, the webinar in April will be the University of Arizona's own Students for Sustainability and how they partner with our facilities management department on a wide range of sustainability issues from energy savings to uh, trash uh, diversion, increasing recycling, uh, harvesting our trash, uh, our recyclables within our football stadium, basketball arena, composting, marking of sustainability plans, and many others. That will be a very interactive with 10 of our uh, students uh, from sustainability and the partnership they have with our facilities departments. Uh, we're looking at Thought Leader Series uh, from last year, 2017. Uh, we'll be working with Nina uh, from Jacobs and presenting that in May. And then we're looking, coming into June, we're looking at utility master planning and how do we market that, similar to how we did with our deferred maintenance, how do we market uh, to senior administration to get the proper funds, assessing our utility infrastructure, and then also looking, putting a plan in place to get funds to address our aging infrastructure. Uh, so with that said, remember you get CEU credits uh, for these webinars. Jeremy and Jim, uh, thank you very much. Renee, thank you always for your support behind the scenes. Uh, with that said, uh, thank you, APA. Uh, thank you, all our regions. We appreciate all your support very much. Have a great day and a great weekend, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.